very often when you hear me talk about our current current government, you hear me you hear me use the words use fantasy, make believe uh, all the time. And this is because our government loves to live in this fantasy make believe world where the UK is somehow top top dog again in the world and that we have this massive trading empire again you know the empire is back in force and we are somehow this magical country again where everything is going right and nothing could ever possibly go wrong even though you know you have to open the curtain and you discover you know the entire country is potentially on fire but it's like that dog meme of you know sitting in the fire just drinking his coffee saying hmm this is fine and not only that we also have had the recent launch of GB News, which is going to be incredibly damaging to our democracy. You just have to ask any American and any politically knowledgeable American, even on the left, and they will tell you that, you know, Fox News has damaged American democracy incredibly bad for so many years. And now, unfortunately, we have something very similar in the form of GB News. So as much as we like to deride it, we can't just ignore it because there will be people watching it. So we have to fight back against it. And already I've have you know, I've got my, you know, my uh, my good morning walk that I do on a Saturday morning. I've now started doing a Wednesday live stream, which, again, I've been struggling to find a name for. But you know what? I could literally just have that Wednesday live stream just be almost dedicated to GB News. And we could call it GB News Watch. And that's that would be literally it. We could literally cover the, the gaffes by GB News. But we have to be very, very wary that our government is currently delivering in this fantasy rhetoric, this fantasy land rhetoric. And it is incredibly dangerous because there's so many people out there who believe this nonsense. And the problem is, when you believe in this nonsense, when things go wrong, well, who do you blame? And that can get into even more dangerous paths in this country. So today we're going to go over to the Byline Times and have a look at an article that they've written about this. So, as always, uh, thank you very much uh, for watching. And please do remember to hit that like, share and subscribe button. And also down below, there are links to my Patreon page and a one-off donation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can, well, buy me coffee. And as always, thank you very much to all those people who do support the channel that way. So, on with the article. So, this again uh, comes from the Byline Times. The title is... Boris Johnson and the Rise of Make-Believe. The Atlantic magazine recently published a fascinating profile of Boris Johnson. The journalist Tom, uh, Tom McTaggart followed the Prime Minister for several weeks in an attempt to try and understand both his character and his political appeal. And he concludes at the heart of Johnson's politics is storytelling. That Johnson is not has not only grasped how to tell a good story but the most popular, the one his voters want to hear. To him, the point of politics and life is not to squibble over the facts, but it's to offer people a story they can believe in, Mataga observes. In a sense, this is not new. Every election campaign in history has required a narrative that can be, communicate, that can be communicated to voters. What has gone right or what has gone wrong? And what the candidate will do in charge to try and change it. This is always involved appealing to emotions, pride, hope, anger and despair. And Johnson is not the first compulsive or, or, or inventive liar to rise to high office. And yet, his storytelling does yield something different. It is not simply that it is false in the way that the truth has no bearing on it. Either way... Understanding Johnson's storytelling is the key to understanding our new politics. And it is not difficult to discern the tale that Johnson is telling. As one aide told uh, Matagi, the, the post-Brexit story is this, puffing out our chest and saying that we're Britain. Operationally, this forms two strands, an emotional theme of old power once again finding its feet 
and the practical story of global Britain striking trade deals with old partners and extending its maximum height at the world summits. Both stories are rooted in different forms of delusion. First, the nostalgia, and second is optics. In terms of global Britain, the story being told, or sold, shall we say, in the direct, is the direct opposition to what is actually taking place. Far from extending out into the world, the UK has slashed its aid, aid budget while erecting stiff, tra stiff trade barriers with its largest neighbours. Abroad, the government talks about tackling corruption, while at home, the sign, it signs off billions of pounds of contracts to its associates. These stories are designed, are designed to specifically to deliver to their intended audience, not, uh, not to other world leaders, but to the viewers and listeners at home. Nobody ever asks why we have to be exceptional, or why other governments fail to exert a similar energy or angst about leading the world. This is the story that Britain has made for itself, and our leaders have chosen a narrative to make us feel better about ourselves. And yet, as with everything Boris Johnson does, his stories are not really about other people so as much as himself. They work for the Prime Minister because they align with his agenda for government, promoting his personal interest and absorbing him of, pl of political responsibility. This week, two specific stories have also arisen to cement this. The Prime Minister's national address was designed with, uh, with all his statements on the coronavirus pandemic to deflect attention away from the overt mismanagement that has gone on. His story is that he could not have predicted an extension of restrictions and could, have, uh, and could not have stopped the spread of the Delta variant. Both assertions are false. Johnson should have known the folly of announcing concrete dates for the roadmap to freedom months in advance, but he was warned about the variant weeks before even taking any action. This current wave of infections is not an act of God, but the result of ministerial negligence. Meanwhile, Johnson used the G7 summit to establish the story about Northern Ireland. Far from being an agreement that the government negotiated, signed and then campaigned for in full knowledge of its consequences, the Northern Ireland Protocol now represents an attack on British sovereignty and territorial integrity. And the EU, the story goes, did not respect the UK borders. The truth of all this is that the problems were predicted and predictable. It is irrelevant. The story was one of triumph and getting Brexit done. Now it is the now, now it has become the injustice of the opposition by the bureaucratic EU. Neither version is true, but that simply just doesn't matter. In our brave new world, the story is all that counts. And stories have anchored all human cultures and societies. We use them to build and locate our identities, to make sense of the world around us. The implicit paradox is that a story suggests something invented, but it is most effective to illuminate the truth. Shakespeare, Jane, Jane Oft and Jane Austen endure not because they invented fictional characters and deceive us into thinking that they are real, not because through the medium of something imagined, but because they reveal truths about the human experience. Johnson's stories are the direct opposite. These are fictions designed not to enlighten, but to obfuscate. The Prime Minister has instruments... Oh, <laughs> dear me. Oh, bless me. The Prime Minister has, uh, has not enlightened us, but to obfuscate, to advance not our own happiness, but his. The Prime Minister has instrumentalised us, not as his subjects of our own story, but a vehicle for his. His story is not about the great resilient Britain but about the genius of a cartoon charlatan rising to high office. He has successfully pulled off the con of the century and the population has fallen at his feet. That is not always a problem uh, for stories to be untrue. Isaacson and Iberson in 18, 1884 and the play The Wild Duck examines the notion of a life lie, a false narrative that we induct, indoctrinate ourselves into to shape our daily lives, networks, and sense of self. Sometimes the lie imprisons us in, mystery, in misery and mystery. Other times, it's what keeps us alive. It all rests on one nature, that of belief. 
and Johnson's rally to the British self-belief encourages our denial of our history and our fantasy of the present. The toxicity of exceptionalism cannot improve a country or the lives of its people, less, uh, still less than advancing healthy relationships with other nations. It is not good offering people a story to believe in if it ends in harm. A wider problem is that the generalised belief of unmoored from the moral imperative is replacing reality reality altogether in both america and britain this has transcended individual leaders to infect political parties and indeed the entire political system donald trump administrations uh, ended with its biggest lie that it should not legitimately have ended at all as the academic brian klaus has noted people have not fully come to terms with the dystopian realization that the political base of one of two US major parties doesn't inhabit a fact-based reality. This approach to both Johnson and Trump's fully discarded the, re the real facts and decency and shared values. Nothing matters unless people believe the story, and as soon as they do, the next one they can believe is even more extreme. This form of storytelling has, has caused the way to any link with objective reality and has severed us and seeks to ultimately convince people that objective reality simply does not exist. And this goes on to talk about further than post-truth, which relates itself to the truth in order to even accept or deny it. And by contrast, the framework, neither does it acknowledge nor exist the truth. It is a real work of genius and it just takes no interest at our objective facts at all. The Prime Minister's words may not have been demonstrably true, but it makes no difference because he has taken no account of the truth while even speaking to them. So the truth is we've got a really bad situation here. And I've said before, Johnson himself is a good storyteller. So what we have to do as essentially opposition is, first of all, tell a better story. And not only that, we have to pull Johnson down at the same time. And Keir Starmer at, question, at Prime Minister's Question Times has done a good job at cross-examining uh, Boris Johnson, has pulled him down. The problem is that, I've said before, Labour needs to find its new Alistair Campbell. It needs to find a way and someone who can take that Labour story and spin it out to the mass general public and find simple and easy ways and better ways of out telling the story of Johnson in realities of what's really going on. You know, it's it's so funny that we've had, you know, as was mentioned there, Pretty Patel talking about the corruption in the world when we've had some of the biggest corruption scandals, at least in the past century, if not more, happen just this year. But that's unfortunately where we are. And we have to get out there and start telling people what's really going on. So, like I say, uh, thank you for all those people who do support me because, again, this is one of those mediums where we can help fight back and tell more truth. So, as always, thank you very much to all those people who do support me. And if you do want to support uh, me and other people like this, then please do head down below to the Patreon page or the one-off donation link to buy me a coffee. Or remember to hit the like and share button. Like I say, that does help spread the message and spread the word. So, as always... Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you all next time.